Joining um, our special guest tonight will be the Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden. So it will be Carla and Carla tonight. So please welcome. You first learned about her on Top Chef. She became a star after the chew. Please welcome author, chef, personality, Miss Carla Hall. I'm the other Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you? <laughs> so, Dr. Hayden, I, w I saw your name on the wall of all of the, you know, the chief libra librarians. Is that what we call you? The, what, is, what is your title? It's hard to say. Okay. But I'm the Librarian of Congress. Okay, the Librarian of Congress. And you guys, I was up there and I saw the Carla, I covered up her middle name. I covered up all the letters after the H, 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 A. And I'm like. Because <laughs> it is creepy. <laughs> well, I just have to tell you, we are just delighted that you're here with us because there are a, a few things that being a librarian of Congress, you know, work with wonderful people and do things. But to be able to do this, oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And Thank that you're you. sharing it with me. And we're going to talk about some of these things here. Uh, that, But I know that there's one burning question that most of the people here who now are a little hungry, they're real excited. Brought some tacos. So I, we just saw about El Pastor, and it got me hungry. So could you, full disclosure, just give us some recommendations in the DMV area? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, Thank you, I think. You know, it's so interesting. I just ran into Victor Albisu. He has Taco Bamba. And so Victor, as of two days ago, he had, uh, I think, 14 um, locations, and it'll be 15 soon. And so I think, like, overall, you can pretty much find um, a Taco Bamba and Al Pastor there. Matthew, um, where are we at? Cielo Rojo? Um, we're in Tacoma Park in Maryland, and they have their new location. Um, and they actually have the pit. And I, I wanted to go there and make uh, a trompo, uh, but my schedule didn't, didn't permit. I was like, oh, can I come by? And they called me like, hey, you ready? I'm like, no, I can't go. <laughs> um, but there, there are a few places to, to have Al Pastor around, yeah. Well, thank you, because we had to get that out of the way. <laughs> Al, how did this show come about? You said it's what's organic. How did this happen? It was. So I was at a dinner party. You know, it starts out, you're at a dinner party. This is why you talk to people. <laughs> so I was at a dinner party um, with my literary agent. Her husband was a, did television production. And I was just, I happened to be talking about how when I meet people, if I'm in a car and the driver is from somewhere else, and I'm like, hey, um, What's, what's a food that you miss from home or that you enjoy versus saying, how are you? How are you doesn't go very far. But when you talk about somebody's food and they're like, oh, let me tell you. So I like this and this and this. And it, you know, it's, it's that exchange. And I was talking about that. Um, the, my, the, my, my literary agent's husband went and told somebody Two weeks later, they're like, I think it's a show. And then like six weeks later, we were, we were shooting like a pilot, like not a pilot, like a, a sizzle reel. And it just went, it was like, and then, and then everything went dark for like a year and a half. <laughs> I, just, I just want y'all to know that it went dark, like nothing. Um, but it was so organic in that the conversation started. I am very interested in people. The one thing that I say is my superpower is that I genuinely like people. I don't pretend to like people. Like you come up and talk to me and you're like, look, I gotta go. <laughs> you know, and the stranger's like, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I really, I really like people and I'm curious about people. And so that connects to the food. Yes, yes. But you had a different journey to food. Yes, because I also wanted to share how so many of, I wanted to give credit to the cultures that had a hand in the dish that aren't always represented. And so often in this culture, we'll see something that's really cool on um, TikTok or, uh, uh, or Instagram, 
and, and somebody will have changed the name. And you're like, like, you know, like when did tip become hacked? Like you don't know when it happened, but all of a sudden it's, it's a thing, right? And so sometimes without telling the story, because they'll say recipe, question mark, but they just want the, the data, you know, the ingredients, but they don't want the story. And by leaving out the story, you leave out somebody's contribution and history. And when you keep doing that, then all, and it's just a dish, it doesn't hold anything of the people when food is actually more culture than it is, it's, than it's just sustenance. And I wanted to bring that back. And I wanted to keep traveling back. So then what about this? What about that? And so when you think about it, like all of those things that happened, like especially in Al Pastor, um, people are the butterfly effect. So if they have to leave and that, that person goes to a new place and then, but they're bringing all of the history from the last place they were, but then they have to use what is there, then it changes everything. It is the butterfly effect. And then everybody around them, they're like, oh, I like this. And then they take it and then they move. So food really, people want to own it but it doesn't really belong solely to that moment it, because it keeps changing. So you also say that food connects, we can all connect through food. Yes. yes. And at this time when there's a real need for connection. There show. is such a need for connection and you have this book, Carla's Comfort Food, so. This is my own copy I have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting it signed. So I started doing that book um, and I remember thinking about, and I, I thought of it around 2007. It came out, I think, in, it came out in 2011, but I started thinking about it. Um, and I was like, you know, if you have a smothered chicken dish, I'm from the South, and you have a smothered chicken dish, um, but if you take out the milk and you add sour cream and some paprika, you could be in Hungary. Now you've left, mm. right, you've left the South and now you're in Hungary. But if you take out the sour cream and you add wine and heavy cream and maybe some mustard, and it's all chicken, now you're in France, right? And so if you take that out and you add some peppers and some plantains and some chilies and some tomatoes, you could be in West Africa, and maybe some peanut butter. The thing is they're all smothered chicken dishes. So it was like, wait a minute, I, everybody has chicken, but you have a different way of showing it. Everybody has a nose, but it looks very differently. But if we can talk about the things that bring us together, everybody may have a rice dish, but we make it differently. But to honor how you're making those dishes and not saying that you're wrong for making it the way that you make it in your part of the world or your community is really where we need to go. And it helps when you need to find another recipe for chicken. <laughs> and then there's the practical side. Okay, because full disclosure, this is one of my favorites. Not just because it's Carla's comfort foods. The book is used. It's used. It's used. You can tell. <laughs> this is the best part. The international spice chart. Yes. You should. It. It has American. The, the the spices. The miscellaneous. All of the things. So you can. The Greek. You can take the chicken and here's how you make it. You do. It's the best. So it's chart. like 18 different cuisines, and it has all of the aromatics, the spices, and and I used it. It's not. It's not the stuff that you need to go and get at a specialty store. Nope. These are the basic things. So if you're from Iowa. And, and I said this once, if you're from Iowa, and I happen to be in Iowa, I said, this will work. You don't have to have anything special, right? And it's to give you a taste of how those spices change and how everybody uses them. Because if you only know how to roast a chicken, then you have 18 different ways of roasting to that roast chicken. roast a chicken. Right, and, you're, and, right? and I love how you're laughing, because you see, you've been going and getting this book. Uh, well, you should, because that's the part. It may be hard to find, because there's 60 cases in my story, so that's a whole other story. <laughs> there's an online service. Order it. It'll be When great. they said they weren't selling, I said, I'll buy them. But I don't know this, if be that chart cases. just really goes yeah. into what your... Yes. Your series is about. Yes, that you exactly. you are, you know, going to these different places. And, like, one episode has about the erasure of princes. Yes. It's oh, that was hard. It's a place in Nashville where you uh, 
grew up. Yeah, so hot chicken, um, we what did. Is hot chicken? Hot chicken is a fried chicken. It's like shrimp scampi. It's fried chicken, and then it goes into a hot oil. So, um, so actually, you could call it pollo chicken. I mean, like chicken chicken. Okay, wait. <laughs> You know, shrimp, scampi, shrimp, shrimp, right? Okay. We have a... um, so it's fried chicken, and then it gets um, tossed in a hot oil, and then for varying degrees. So I, I decided to do hot chicken because, one, I had a hot chicken restaurant for a very short period of time. I mean, like, blink, and it was gone and open and gone. <laughs> and um, but I, I had that restaurant, and I remember going to the folks at Prince's and saying, um, oh, hey, I'm going to open up a hot chicken place. And they're like, oh, okay. And I thought they were just busy that day. I don't know, in my head, they were just busy, so they weren't reacting like the way that I wanted them to react. Um, it wasn't until that interview during this show that they were telling me how Prince's Hot Chicken, well, first of all, it started as Prince's Barbecue Chicken, and then it became Prince's Hot Chicken. And then when they had the Hot Chicken Festival, it became Nashville Hot Chicken, and now it's Hot Chicken. So you see every iteration, their name is further and further away from the history of the dish. And so they were talking about that, and they were talking about how they can't even throw their trash out because of the dumpster diving, and people are trying to go through their trash to figure out how they make their hot chicken. And I'm sitting there like, what? And I, I am cheering up, and I, and, I, and I was so apologetic. I said, I just got it. Like, I just understood. And Simone, Mrs. Jeffrey's daughter, she said, I saw that you just got it. They assume that I'm just going to waltz up and because I'm Carla on television, that I'm going to tell them, hey, I'm doing a hot chicken place. But I, I thought I was sort of getting permission, but not really getting permission, but still honoring them and, and saying, hey, wanting a blessing. But I got like, I got my, my hand slapped, but they didn't really, I didn't really get it. And, and that was part of the, uh, that was one of the first episodes that we were filming that I'm like, okay, this is what this show is gonna be about and it's uncovering it. And I said, I'm part of the problem too. Like I'm not really honoring it either. And I said, I will never call it just hot chicken again. In my head, it's Prince's hot chicken because I, every time you say it, you are bringing up their legacy. It's like an Arnold Palmer. Did, did the guy even make lemonade or tea? <laughs> did he? But his name is attached. And so being able to put the stories and the history back into the Yes, place. and, and asking part. people to be curious about it and not just ask for a recipe. So if you want a recipe, it's like, tell me more about this dish. Tell me why it's important to you. Because in, in, and that's what I loved about JJ is showing all of these um, cookbooks and there's so much story. And then coming here, there's so much rich history and stories attached to the books. Um, that it just becomes a living, breathing thing. And that's what makes it interesting. And that, that's actually the story that brings us all together, that connects us as people. And you did a lot of research. Uh, for this. Yes, we did a did lot of research. That? We had a lot of producers. We had people whose job it was to go and look at these things. And there were some that we had to push back on. Because in, um, in the barbecue episode, we went to, um, is this being filmed? No, I'm just kidding. Um, and the bar yes. <laughs> and I think there are some bloggers here. No, it's fine. No, it's fine. This, I've talked about this story. It's fine. Um, but no, in, this, in the, the barbecue episode, we ended up going to a restaurant in Memphis. Ooh. And I remember saying, even before we got there, I was like, all right, so t we're going to this restaurant and the person's last name was like a German last name. And I'm like, wait, what? Why are we going there? Um, but then I learned that, you know, in order to have a lot of ribs, you had to have a lot of refrigeration. And in order to have, and, and the, the baby back ribs used to be the things that basically were put into the, the barrels to keep the meat from rolling around and nobody, nobody was really using them. Um, and then, in, and when you think about it, it wasn't whole hog. It was like you, this extra piece is just hanging out in the fridge until you accumulate a lot of them and then you make them. And so you had to have money in order to accumulate them, right? Um, but so we went to this place and we're sitting there and we're eating and they're telling me this, all this story is about Mr. German with his last name H. 
And then, um, I can't remember because I'm menopausal. It's not because I'm trying to be cryptic. And we'll talk about that later. Yeah. We'll talk uh, about that. There, there's a reason we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's not forget. <laughs> we might. Okay. So that's, there are two yeah, Pause for the minute. Okay. Um, but um, so I was sitting there and I said, so whose recipe was it? And the guy who owned it, who had just been working there for many years because he needed a job, he was like, oh, oh, that was the guy who, and his wife who was cooking, he was a black guy who um, was in the, the, national, the, the Negro Baseball League, and she was blah, blah. I said, well, I want to know about them, right? I mean, so that was the thing. So all of the people who made the dishes were in the back, but the people who sold it did not look like the people in the back. And so, and, uh, uh, so, so again, it, it, and that's why in some of the books that you see, if you're illiterate, who is writing the book? You saw a cookbook today yes. that illustrated that. Yes. A woman who wrote a, well, she couldn't read or write. And she put, and these other women uh, who weren't African-American, mm -hmm were translating or transcribing it and they put all kinds of weird all kinds of things um like chair it, it, i can't remember one of the examples but when you look at it you're like that doesn't make succotash sense. like succotash what is it su su something yeah it wasn't succotash <laughs> um but the thing the nice thing about that was she listed them they they were listed as the people who transcribed it. So they were giving credit to her, which was great, but that wasn't always the case. And she had someone write a disclaimer saying, I don't know what these women put in here. <laughs> I cannot read or write. This is like 1912. Yeah, yeah. I can't read or write, so if it doesn't come out right, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Wasn't that amazing? It was amazing. It and was amazing. She said, I'm sorry. I can't. Yeah. I don't know. And there were some of those like, oh. Yeah. So so reclaiming the history mm -hmm. in that. Now you're you're also the executive director. You're just so how did I'm that an happen? executive producer. Producer. Yes, yes. This was my first time um being an executive producer and having a say, and I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. And actually getting the information and being able to go through it and having some pushback about how these stories were told. Um, and that, was, that, that felt really good. And everybody said, I, we just want you to feel good about it. And so once they, we finished filming, and then we had, um, we had, they had edited it, they sent it to me, and I'm like, ooh. Oh, I don't. I, I don't really like it. Really? Yeah, and, and it was because it didn't really have the heart that I remembered, that I had experienced. Um, and the, show, the showrunner was really wonderful, and she tried twice, and she said, I don't think I'm doing this justice for Carla. And then they brought in someone else, and then they reworked it, and then that's what we have here. Wow. I mean, imagine if you worked so hard, 84 days of filming on something, and you're not in control of it, so that when it comes out, you, people are like, ooh. And you're like, ooh. <laughs> and then, you know, and so at least I, I was able to say something about it, because I turned to the executive producer, and I called him. Well, the director, first of all, I, um, April, April Jones, and I said, I really don't like it. And she said, you have to tell them. I said, really, can I do that? She's like, yeah, You're a producer. you absolutely should do that. And I told them and, I, and they reacted and they actually footed the bill to re-edit wow. it. The, the network did not foot that bill. But uh, I mean, but if I come to you and I'm like, <laughs> I hate it. That and bad, huh? <laughs> Whoa. Must have been you just something. wouldn't want to see my face. I wow. remember telling Matthew, my husband's here, I was like, oh my God, I don't like it. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, and I knew that, but I knew all the bones were there because I was there. So and I, and I, I knew it was there, it was just how it's edited. That's also, you know, when you see something, um, the editing is so important, and the, the voice of the person who's doing the editing, like the vision and the storyteller. The storyteller is the, per is the most important 
person because you have, you just have footage. It's like if you all do something in social media and it's just how you edit it, you can tell the story. The editor is the most important person. Ah. Now you mentioned pushback a couple of times. What, could you give us a little example of what, what kind of pushback would you give? So um, when there is a story, like for instance, the, um, the barbecue, and knowing that we went to Memphis. And then the, the next showrunner said, okay, we're gonna tell this story in a different way. And so then we ended up going to, um, to tell barbecue from the perspective of uh, somebody in LA who was closer to it. Um, because we really didn't wanna tell the story through another culture who wasn't actually making it. Because one of the things that we saw, a lot of the pit masters who have, sometimes they have, there were two guys in Virginia, they had about, I don't know, 50 years of experience between the two of them, these young guys. And, um, but they say when they compete, they can't afford the, the fees, they can't afford to get off work, to go, they can't afford the pig. So what happens is you have the brands who are sponsoring people. And those people who are going and say, calling themselves pit masters will have tools like gadgets but they can't look at the pig and say, you're done, <laughs> right? So are they a master or are the tools the master? Uh -huh. <laughs> so you're, you're, now wait a minute now, you're exposing a lot of things here. I mean, we're, we're well, they there. know they're using tools. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, so one of, the, one of the things was to make sure that we talked about these things and even bringing up, and as close as we are to Virginia barbecue, how many of you all really know about Virginia barbecue? Exactly, it is Not in our backyard. Hand. Oh, one person? No, you one, were just scratching. One, maybe. <laughs> I didn't know about Virginia barbecue. Exactly. You know, and so it was, it's not really talked about because it's whole hog barbecue. It was the first time that, so when, that I learned that the trifecta, you had the Europeans who were like the presidents, the people in politics who were having these big events. This is how they were bringing people together. You had the indigenous people who were showing how to dig the barbacoa, the, the pit, and then you had the spices. You needed all three cultures to make barbecue, right? All three. But when you see repeatedly that two of the three are being left out of the story, then so the, the choice was, let's tell the story of the other two because the other story is already out there. But Virginia barbecue. So in telling these stories, did you ever think, and I think you mentioned it, that would this be shown at this time? I, I didn't because well, we were very open and upfront and we tried to uh, use this as a tool for, to tell history and in pictures and all of that and, and be very open. I mean, even I say, you know, in one of the first episodes where I talk about the father of ice cream and how, you know, he had the, um, the, he didn't really patent his um, machine to freeze ice cream, um, but then a white woman did. And then, uh, uh, and then I say that, you know, and I- You said it? Oh yeah, it, it was written down and I read it and I said it. <laughs> so I knew that there were a couple of those instances in the show and um, this show you all, by the way, was on the shelf for two years while, um, while Time Warner and Discovery were coming together. So there was a lot of transition and I, I just wasn't sure if it was ever gonna come out. And then it was also during a time when everybody was talking about the book bands and everything. I said, oh my God, I talked about the white lady and then I talked about the father of ice cream. You know, and then it's not gonna come out. And, you, you thought know. you were gonna be banned. Oh, I thought I, thought I was gonna be canceled. But, but the thing is, I always say, and I know my assistant's here, she's probably cringing right here. Kirsten, stop looking at me. <laughs> It's um, on the internet now. She's like, oh my God. Yeah. It's... Uh, and Matthew does it too. What is she going to say? Nobody ever knows what I'm going to say. Um, no, but the thing is, I always say, 
if I say something, I believe it. I don't flippantly say things. So if you cancel me, I would have gotten canceled for something I believed. But I believe I'm always thinking about the group. I am always thinking about people. I am very intentional. When I, even when I judge on a show, I will say, if I can still explain myself, and it's just me and you in a dark alley, I'm going to do that. I'm going to, I, my opinion is my opinion. And so I will share it with you. I have, I mean, speaking of that, I've had chefs come up. Well, I was on Beat Bobby Flay and you didn't vote for me. And I said, what did you make? I said, oh, let me tell you, this is why. <laughs> um, so remember, it was all about this and you did that. You didn't do this and it was about this. You know, so I, I stand by my word and I will tell you exactly why I thought it. I don't, I don't choose the popular route just because everybody is going that way. So I figure if you're going to cancel me, it will be something that probably later you will think about and say, yes, yeah, she was right. <laughs> well, we're glad that they didn't cancel. And so what are some of the other episodes? Where are you so going? we have ice cream, yes. um, which is great. And Dondermer is so amazing. It was so delicious. Um, it's the Turkish ice cream made with salop, which is ground um, purple orchids, which is stretchy. You eat it with a knife and a fork. It was just fabulous. I loved Istanbul, just loved it. Um, we do shrimp and grits. Um, yeah, it's so good. The shrimp and grits was so amazing. And, um, and also how that is a story of putting, um, one, it started in Charleston with the Gullah Geechee people, but then we go on to, for, um, pause for the minute, I will think of her name eventually, um, where she basically uses shrimp and grits to put all of her, her family's heritage into the, the sauce. Um, we do um, the barbecue, which is slow and slow. We do, of course, the al pastor, um, hot chicken, and then we do um, chicken pot pie. Yes, chicken pot pie! And let me tell you why I had to do chicken pot pie. Chicken pot pie runs parallel to my culinary journey. I, it was the first dish that I learned to make. I made um, um, Julia Child's version. It, I felt like it took a week, but it was only three days. <laughs> And I didn't even make the crust. I swear it took me a long time. Um, it felt like the chicken was cooling for two days and I had to pick it off. Um, so I did that. And then when I, had, when I was on Top Chef, I did chicken pot pie and I was on Jimmy Fallon. So then on my first cookbook, I had to have chicken pot pie. So of course I had to do chicken pot pie on my first travelogue show. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Oh, that's going to be great. Well, well, you talked about your culinary journey. So growing up, and we're very pleased that tonight, it's just happenstance. Your mom is visiting from Nashville. Yes. Where's mama? Where's mom? There's mom. Where are you? Oh, right here. I was looking for your red and you have your coat on. Yes, that's my mom, Audrey, the lady who looks like me. That's what I'm going to look like at 82. Yeah. There's mom. So that worked out really well. And you said she had six dishes? Yes, yeah, six dishes, one including uh, breakfast for dinner, which is pancakes. But um, my mother makes the best pancakes. So grand, uh, mama would make um, a pot roast. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong, mama. Um, meatloaf, um, chicken in a bag, you know, and I helped to that one. Um, and then uh, she did spaghetti. Um, and and by, I know this is not to put you out. I, the first time that I had full lengths of spaghetti was in college because mama would break that spaghetti. So <laughs> I mean, it was like rice aroni, child. I was like, oh my God. I didn't even know. <laughs> like, oh my God, this is what it looks like? Oh my God. This is spaghetti? She's you know? giving you the eye. You know that. <laughs> Mom's giving you the eye. Um, and then. Um, she made uh, one, oh, uh, hamburger helper. Yeah, so in one of my cookbooks, I said, Mama's hamburger, help me. Yeah, uh, yeah. I made her version, yeah. yeah. And your children's book. Yes, so my children's book, um, which I did with uh, Kristen Hartke and Sharice Harris, another C-H, what? <laughs> um, 
interestingly, so I, I've been wanting to do a children's book for years, and in the front, they have, to the dedications, it says, um, it says, to my mother, Audrey Adder Atherley, and I was like, oh my God, they, that my na the name is wrong for my mother, Audrey, but uh, Sharice Harris is the mother, the, the illustrator, her mother's name was Audrey as well, and I was like, oh. anyway, um, <laughs> so yeah, this, this book is about Black Santa, and, um, but yeah, but it's, it's so great. I sorry. I, I love this book. I have another one coming out, Carla and the Tin Can Cake Party in summer of 2025. Uh, I, I really, I, I really enjoyed this experience more so than my cookbooks. Actually, there's only one recipe. Um, but you talk about the family dinners. And, yes, and the family that. dinners and going to my grandmother's house and how the, all this food would be there. We would go up there for Christmas and then how I wanted to, um, we left, a, uh, we left uh, in the story, we leave a cookie out for Santa and then I go and I bite it and then my sister's like, oh, you're in trouble because it was Santa's cookie, and then I get called to the kitchen by my grandmother, and she said, Carla, and I thought I was in trouble. She's like, well, let's just make him a Christmas cornbread. He gets too many cookies anyway. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that, yeah, I, I love this, I love this one. I, 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 for the first 10 times I read it, I cried. I know. Well, you tear up, you tear, but then I got hungry because of the cornbread, and you yes. describe it all and everything. It just, it just really takes you back. It yeah. takes you back. Well, we're, you started cooking though. Now I have this down here at 24 years old. Yeah. Now that was as a chef. No, no, that was like just cooking. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> that was not professional. That was, I think I'm going to make some eggs. <laughs> no, I, I did not cook. I mean, as a matter of fact, um, I invited some friends over for, um, when I was working at Price Waterhouse, I was an accountant, and I invited them over for dinner, and I made a tomato soup, and I used like four cans of tomato paste. <laughs> that face, we went out. I, d I just didn't cook. I, I didn't cook. I didn't, I actually, and I don't know why I'm outing myself. I didn't even do dishes until. I'm looking at mom. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, okay. I didn't do dishes until I was probably in college. And I want you all, I was born in 1964. There was a time and place, even if you didn't want to be in the kitchen, the kids weren't in the kitchen. So I didn't, I wasn't invited in there. I, it wasn't, yeah, we just came in there to eat, to get a snack. We did, we did, we weren't eating. So when people talk about their childhoods and they talk about cooking, I'm like, oh, that's great. <laughs> I, I just didn't have it. But what I did, because I love to eat, like I, I ate a lot. I just loved food. I would eat a bag of oranges. I loved food. My grandmother would make this cornbread and she wouldn't make it until we were on the inside of the door. And she would make this cornbread and I was like, oh my gosh, it's just the best. So when I started cooking, I had to reverse engineer. It was the memory of food. That's why it's so visceral for me. Like even I could taste things from long ago. I'm like, okay. And, and so going to culinary school was teaching me how to reverse engineer, giving me the, t the, the tools and techniques to take flavors from my head to my hand to the plate. Wow. That takes a lot. It takes a lot, but you know what? A lot of people rely too much on a recipe because they're like, I want, what is the recipe without their memory of the dish? And without the memory of the dish, you can never, because it's just, you have to interpret it. You have to live it. You have to be it. You have to, uh. Boy, once you got into it, you got into yes, it. Yes. I, I mean, I love it. I'm like. <laughs> now this gets into, okay. So now I think this is the perfect time to get into why we mentioned menopause. Yes. The, would you get the off one questions? woman, please? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. I forgot. <laughs> no. So, okay, I'm turning 60 this year, y'all. This is my 60th campaign. Yes. Um, and I, you know how they say that the, um, I mean, like the the youth is what, what is it? It's wasted. It's wasted. Yeah. But On when you young. get to be old, you get older, you have this wisdom. And I believe that 
as I age and I have this wisdom, why throw it away? Why allow people to tell me that I'm too old to do it, dot, dot, dot? And I'm not. I have all this wisdom, so I want to write more chapters. I want to do more things. So one of the things that I'm doing, I wanted to do theater as a child, so I am doing a one-woman show. So, <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep, and speaking of menopause, you know there's that book, The Spook Who Sat By The Door? Yes. That, that vignette is called The Vagina That Sat By The Door. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because we are underlooked and we can like come up stealthily and take over some stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, now that's... A <laughs> <laughs> well, there oh. we go. Sorry. Well, that, when is that going to happen? And I'm um. really looking at mom now. <laughs> Uh, when is that going to happen? So I'm it's working really on it. Happen. I'm going to work on it with um, the folks at Olney and Olney Theater. Um, and then, so uh, uh, yeah, fun. and then we're developing it this summer. I have, t I, so you all know Tiffany Derry, who's in Texas, who did Top Chef with me. So she is doing a food and wine um, show. And she said, Carla, how's your one woman show going? I was like, great. She said, will you be ready by November? When in November? She said, November 9th. We'll be ready. <laughs> I say, build it and they will come. So, Invite the people and you'll clean up your house, okay? <laughs> well, they're telling us, and I, I know you're going to sign some books and you do this. So before we go, I also have to ask you about your signature eyewear. How did that happen? And what, because I tried to select some that, you know. Oh, is that what you chose? I tried. <laughs> I started to wear the bigger ones, but I knew you were going to wear the bigger ones. And so then I said, well, at least it has... Yes. So, what makes a good pair of glasses? I mean, I'm a seven wing eight Enneagram. I don't know how not to say what's in it's here. Okay, it's okay, because she's got on some nice ones. You have on great glasses. There you go. You're, you're an eight? C-H. Oh, C-H. Oh! Well, that's why. That's why. C-H, yes. Okay, so I, I mean, so I call my glasses um, face art. And I have 71 pairs. And um, I've bought them all because we're waiting to any, any opticians out there, anybody we're trying to figure out the eyeglass mafia. Um, <laughs> but um, I think that you have to go and have somebody style you Ooh. because the people who are doing glasses, they will look at you. They look at your skin tone. They look at your eyes. They look at the, the distance between um, your eyes and your ears. They look to see if your face is symmetrical. All of these things, your, all the things. Right? And so I bet you would look good in some nice small round ones. Do you have any of those? I will. <laughs> Thank you very much. So the next time I'm gonna have I wanna some go with you. The Magoo kind. Okay. I just I'm good. I'm good. Well thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>